Wisconsin Book Festival and our event this afternoon with author John Galligan. Um, very happy to have him here and happy that you're able to join us. Uh, before we get underway, we just have a short video, uh, one minute or so. So I'll uh, share that with you and then we'll be back to get things underway. One moment. Make sure I do this right. Welcome to the 2020 Central Wisconsin Book Festival. This week of amazing events is possible only because of the support of our sponsors, which include the Marathon County Public Library, the Friends of the Marathon County Public Library, the MCPL Foundation, the Community Arts Grant Program of the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin with funds provided by the Wisconsin Arts Board, which is a state agency, the Community Foundation, and the B.A. and Esther Greenheck Foundation, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, the Merco Foundation Fund, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Master Gardener Program of Marathon County, North Central Area Congregations Organized to Make an Impact, or Naomi, and Yonkey Bookstore. Thank you to all of our friends and partners who make the Wisconsin Book Festival possible. And we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Well done, John. All right. Well, welcome, John Galligan. John is the author of seven novels, including the just published Dead Man Dancing, just published last month, in fact. Uh, in addition to uh, being a novelist, he's worked as a newspaper journalist, which we were just discussing, a feature film screenwriter, house painter, au pair, ESL teacher, cab driver, and freezer boy in a salmon cannery. Like so many fiction writers, he's done a little bit of everything. A lot of stupid stuff, yeah. <laughs> yep. He also teaches writing at Madison College, a native of Madison. John is a graduate of UW-Madison with degrees in environmental policy and English literature. So, John, welcome. Um, for folks who have joined us, it uh, looks like at the moment there's just a few of us, so um, we'll kind of chat for a while, but we'll, uh, we can turn your audio on, folks. If you have questions for John, you can also submit them via the chat function down at the bottom of the screen. You can click on that and uh, submit a question that way. So. Um, John, I know we want to talk about a number of, or you know, several of your books, but we want to start with Dead Man Dancing, which is the um, second in the series about Heidi Kick, the first mm -hmm. female sheriff in the history of the fictional Wisconsin County of Bad Axe. That's right. Um, so let's start, and we want to have you share some some from the book. Um, but before we, we get into that, um, how did the idea for this series come about? Yes. Um, well, I had, I had done a four book series uh, that was a mystery slash crime series. Uh, and the protagonist was a, a fly fisherman. And I think those were, were very successful books. They were, they were great fun to write. But um, they, I kind of got pigeonholed a little bit, as in those were fishing books. And so I thought, all right, well, I want to reach a little broader audience. So I'm going to write about um, a region. So I wrote about my favorite region, which is where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting in what's called the Driftless uh, area of Wisconsin. I'm over, I'm in, I'm in Vernon County, um, over in Viroqua, um, sort of close to the Mississippi River. So I, I decided to write about this region and I wrote a novel about this region and my agent took it and read it and she said, hmm, I'd like you to write the same book but with a different story. And, and what turned out, and that, you know, once I recovered from that, um, <laughs> and figured out what that meant, what it really meant was, um, there was a character in that, in that you know, uh, failed novel, that was worth uh, pursuing, and it was a young um, local woman who'd become a deputy sheriff, and uh, she was kind of a live wire, and so she became Heidi Kick, and and I, I've long uh, observed and admired a certain kind of character that I find out here. In fact, my first book in the fly fishing series is where this character first came about, but a young woman who, you know, in high school um, is 
in the choir, is on the softball team, is on the rodeo team, is, is a straight A student, uh, milks cows in the morning, can drive every kind of vehicle, uh, uses firearms, uh, possibly chews tobacco, and is beautiful and, and brave. And so uh, I really love that kind of character. And so that's how Heidi Kick came about was she's that kind of person uh, and grew up that way. And she went through a terrible tragedy um, as a teenager. She was a dairy queen. She kind of rose to the heights of, of that and then suffered a, a family tragedy and um, went through some really rough times and emerged on the other side of it as somebody who wanted to be in law enforcement. So that's Heidi Kick. She's a local. She's actually from Crawford County, which is south of my fictional Bad Axe County. Uh, so she's the sheriff in the county to the north of where she grew up. Um, Bad Axe County is a made up county in a real place. I've wedged it between Vernon County and Crawford County. And historically, Vernon County used to be called Bad Axe County. I'm not sure why it changed. I haven't figured that out yet. But so I got started, you know, writing in this area that I love to be in and, and I spend a lot of time in. So even though Bad X County is fictional in name, um, for those who may be unfamiliar with, with the books, uh, are the, there are landmarks, there are real landmarks and, and places in the book that are real, even though the name of the county is fictional? Oh, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, there, there, are, there are landmarks that are real, for example, the Mississippi River. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. a lot of the history is real. And in fact, that's something we should get to eventually in Dead Man Dancing. Um, the, uh, for example, the, this, is the, the, this area is where a Black Hawk and his people fled the army and the militias right through this area and were trapped and massacred against the Mississippi River back in the early, back in like 18... 23 or something like that. Um, so there's there's that history and there's a lot of Black Hawk everything. Everything's Black Hawk this Black and you can actually drive the Black Hawk Trail. Um, so I use that kind of real history. Um, I use uh, place names and people names. I kind of stir them up in a salad. You know, I don't, I just, I'm more interested in the cultural name than its actual attachment to a specific person or a place. Yeah. Um, and I use the, um, topography, the geography, um, especially. Yeah. Cool, cool. Great. Um, so it's really then your editor who is responsible for this series to, to to come about. Yeah, that's interesting. No, not my credit, editor, credit to my, your, my agent. Your agent, I'm sorry. My literary yeah. agent who, who, who basically told me, you know, I think I can sell this book, but I think I shouldn't. I think there's something better. And, uh, you know, this is a, this, that was something that I'd been working on for two or three years, and I just threw it away. Um, <laughs> I know. It must be hard. <laughs> it, it must have yeah, been hard. It, it feels, yeah, it's hard. But, but it was, you know, often that's exactly the right thing to do. Um, sure. You know, and, was and there was, anything, I'm sorry, was there anything no, in I, that novel that was thrown away that you might uh, be yes. able to salvage for something in the future. Yes, I'll be I'll I'll be back to it. Particularly, okay. it was it was uh, it was yeah it was on a theme that maybe wasn't. Um, I think it might follow quite well from three or four books already in the series. Put it that way. Okay, good, good. So it's it's uh, it's hibernating right now. Good. <laughs> Not a complete waste of time. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, before we get any further and, and talk more about your books, I know you wanted to share a little bit from Dead Man Dancing. Would you like to do that now? Sure, I can do that. Great. Here, here, here it is. That doesn't yeah. show up, does it? Um, yeah. That's okay. Well, let me set the scene a little bit. Um, this is occurring uh, in March of 2018. Um, and as we know, March in Wisconsin is pretty gnarly, or it could be pretty gnarly. So um, this is taking place at the first farmer's market of the year, which is kind of a bust because it's cold and windy. Uh, and there's just a few Amish people out there selling jelly. Um, there's a polka band um, shivering as they play polka on a street corner. Um, 
And my, my character, Sheriff Heidi Kick, has a day off, which is rare. In fact, she, she's in trouble with her husband and her family for the paucity of days off. Uh, so she's very determinedly taking a day off and she's t taken her three children. She has uh, a daughter named Ophelia Opie, who at this point I believe is seven or eight. And she has twin boys, um, Taylor and Dylan, who at this point, I, I, if, I'd have to double check, but there are about five. Um, and so they've gone to the farmer's market, they've done some shopping, um, the polka band is playing, and it seems overall like a, like a, pretty, good, uh, a pretty good day off. The kids get cold because they won't wear their coats. Uh, and so they go inside the library. You guys will like that. She goes inside the library just to warm up, you know, not to not to read books or anything, just to just to use the heat. Uh, so she's taken her three kids <clears throat> inside the uh, Bad Axe County Public Library so that they can warm up. And this happens, which basically starts the action of Dead Man Dancing. She wasn't done with the market yet. She wanted to look at Hans Lapp's birdhouses made from gourds, but she took the kids inside the library so that Opie could warm up. She sat in a comfortable armchair between the children's books and the window. The sudden warmth made her groggy. She could still hear the next polka coming from Main Street, even though the window looked out on Poole Street, one block west and parallel to Main. She found herself studying the town that was hers to take care of. Establishments along Poole Street mingled rundown old farmstead with tentative new farmstead. Mindy's Repair had been there forever behind its shabby front. Next door to Mindy's was River of Oz, something new, a freshly painted sign depicting a wizard on a flying dragon and offering bodywork and supplements. Then there was the farmstead's Farmstead Eagles Club, Airy 3409, a dull cinder block building she had visited just last week. Next door was probably the most exotic place in Farmstead these days, a dingy little grocery, Mercado Chavez, occupying a former insurance office and catering to the influx of Spanish speaking people who mostly lived in trailers on the grounds of Vista Farms, the factory dairy operation that had appeared last fall on Belgian Ridge. Staring out at Mercado Chavez, her stomach tightened. Hardly more than a cow chip toss away on Main Street, the banners read, Welcomen, we're glad you're here. But there had been friction. She had heard nasty grumbling about invasion and about speak English and about jobs stolen from locals. Not Harley, Harley was her husband, but his family, his mother Belle and his brother Kenny were of that persuasion she knew. Then Opie tugged her sleeve. What, honey? Opie said in a library whisper, Uncle Kenny just drove by with a big flag in his truck. What? That big red flag with the blue and white cross and stars on it. Uncle Kenny? He had a flagpole standing up in the back of his truck. The sheriff roused into a wakeful dread. Uncle Kenny. Here he comes again, Opie whispered. Sheriff Kick gaped in stunned denial at the old two-tone Ford pickup roaring down Pool Street, showing off windshield cracks, rust craters, a mud beard, and a statement. A ranting voice started inside her. God damn you, Kenny, you can't be bullying around Farmstead with a giant Confederate flag posted up in your truck box. The flag caught a cold gust and preened out perfectly behind the truck. God damn it, Harley, your dumbass brother is really not doing this. Then Kenny had gone past. What the hell? That's the Nazi flag, Opie remarked. No, hon, it, it's not. But it's a bad flag. Well, it's going around and around the block. So he was. He was flagging the farmer's market in Little Farmstead, Wisconsin, in front of mostly Amish who were immune to the politics of the English and in front of a few nice old men playing polka for the love of it, the sheriff's brother-in-law was making a display of the Southern Cross, a symbol that in the North had only one meaning. The polka stopped dead. 
in the quiet of the library, the sheriff could hear her brother-in-law rip snorting south to north up Main Street, revving his dirt bag engine and squealing his worn out tires as he cornered on First Street, cornered on Poole Street. And now here he came once more, past the library windows, past the Eagles Club and the Mercado Chavez doing laps. Opie stomped her foot very quietly, but with real force. Mommy, she whispered hotly, do something. So that's how the prologue ends and that's where the action starts because um, she does something. Uh, and what she does gets attention on the internet. Uh, it gets the attention of uh, the kinds of people that we know are out there now, uh, white supremacists all over the globe, basically, um, because she uh, has, you know, violated supposedly free speech rights and charged her brother-in-law with intimidation. And so she becomes a target for some people from out of town, as does Farmstead itself. Um, so that's, that's where it all starts. And the story really gets into... Um, the history of race in this area, which now we're talking about, you know, something that that is real. Um, and so if you want me to go into that now, I can do that. Um, otherwise, we can we can talk about that later. Uh, at the core of the, 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 the crime, the real crime that starts, you know, she she believes it's a crime to drive the flag up and down Main Street. So she charges her brother in law, but the murder that occurs um, to begin the book is the murder of a retired uh, high school history teacher who has written a book about round barns. And if you know about round barns, um, they're fairly unique to, to this area. There are more elsewhere in the United States, but Vernon County in particular has, you know, uh, about 17 or so round barns. And the reason is that um, right before the Civil War, uh, Wisconsin uh, as a state refused to ratify the Fugitive Slave Act, which meant that this was not a state where you could hunt slaves for a bounty. Um, and so as a consequence, the Underground Railroad came through here and its northernmost stop in Wisconsin was in Vernon County in a place called Hillsboro, specifically in a place called Cheyenne Valley. And what happened in Cheyenne Valley is that um, it became in the middle of the 19th century and up through the beginning of the 20th century, it became the largest community of African Americans in Wisconsin. And those African Americans lived in harmony with European immigrants who had no, no dog in the fight, basically. Um, they they didn't come from slavery, they didn't use slaves, they didn't have a political opinion about slaves, they had no preconceived negative ideas about black people and so forth. So Irish and uh, Czech and Polish and so forth, um, they all lived together in this community in Cheyenne Valley, did business together, had schools, had integrated sports teams, intermarried one another and so forth. I didn't realize and they are, that, yeah. Oh. And they are all completely gone. So the question is what happened? And um, the guy who's writing the book about the round barns is interested in the man who actually created the round barn, who was the son of Tennessee slaves named Alga Shivers, a black man, who made himself into an architect and a builder and designed and built these round barns. Um, and really substantial, brilliant, brilliant guy. So the character that gets murdered to start the book is writing a book about the round burns, writing a book about Alga Shivers, uh, and basically writing a book about, well, why, why are these people no longer here? What happened? So it gets into the history of that. And uh, a character from Milwaukee, a young man who is of mixed race and is having trouble with that fact, uh, is central to the book because he travels out here uh, to learn about that history. So it really deals with, uh, you know, the history of race and racism uh, going back to the Civil War to today. Yeah. That's really interesting. I've already learned some things about Wisconsin that I didn't know. Um, 
So with with Heidi Kick, uh, Sheriff Sheriff Kick, there's obviously there are many things that a sheriff would have to deal with and attend to. Um, why with Dead Man Dancing did you decide to take her along this path of race and racism and and white nationalists and that sort of thing? Is it just kind of seem because that seems to be sort of bubbling along the surface in a lot of things that we do these days it's I've been following it's I've, I've been following you know uh hate groups and racist groups for many many years and trying to figure out how to how to write about that um it's obviously in the in the zeitgeist um and it's you know, very, very strong in rural areas, honestly. Um, just the other day, there were, um, there were some um, look like militia members on Main Street in Viroqua with a giant sign, like so big they had, it, had to bring it in on a trailer. And uh, they were standing there with this gigantic sign that said, BLM is a terrorist organization. And there were weapons uh, in view. Um, so that's just, I mean, that's going on in every small town in the United States probably right now. Um, it is lucky and unlucky that the book comes out at just a time when we have Black Lives Matter and we have this, you know, national explosion of energy and awareness and conflict and so forth. But it's something that I've cared about and wanted to write about for a very long time. And, um, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't, the sheriff is not, you know, all that woke, right? She's a, she's, she grew up out here too. And so uh, I really try to be realistic about it and uh, not preachy. She's got this new population of Hispanics in the area that are working at the factory farm. And so she's hired a, a, a deputy who can speak Spanish and she's trying to learn Spanish from him. She doesn't totally understand um, all the nuances of racism and race and, and as a, law enforcement officer is not quite sure what to do about any of it, um, but she is sure that people need to be safe. Um, they have a right to live their lives without being harassed and so forth. So uh, she just seemed like a really good person because she's kind of, she's kind of down the middle. She's a, she's a, she's a good person, but not, um, you know, she's sort of behind the curve on, on racism and race. It's just not something that she's ever really dealt with in her life. Gotcha. But as a new sheriff, it's, uh, you know, relatively new. Um, yeah, it's something that she obviously is forced to deal with. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Um, did you and your agent, um, did you go into this um, before you, or when you were starting Bad X County, did you go into this thinking that it would be a series? Did you have enough material for it? That still seems, and I know this has been, been a trend for quite some time, not only with mysteries, but also science fiction, that it seems like you can't just do one. You can't just yeah, write yeah. one mystery title. Yeah, the, well, the, the industry likes the series yeah. concept. It's it's easier to sell a series than it is to sell, a, you know, somebody's uh, sequence of standalone books. So for sure, you know, it's something that the publishing industry wants. Um, and I you must that's... also like the series format as well, because this is, um, you, you've written the, the Fly yeah. Fishing series and, and now this one. So is, is that um, yes something no. that you're comfortable with as well? Yes, yes and no. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 do like, I do like the fact that, especially that in both of these series, I like the fact that basically you're, you're not telling one story, you know, four different, let's say we have a four book series, you're not telling four different stories, you're telling one big story in four parts. I mean, I like that. And I think that's what, what the culture is getting now out of long form TV. Uh, we're getting a different way of storytelling that allows for much more complexity, uh, many more characters, um, and so forth. So I, I do like that aspect of it. And I feel like with, with Heidi Kick, I'm I'm telling a story of her family growing up, of her kids going through changes, of her of her marriage from year to year, uh, how the job evolves. You know, she starts out as an interim sheriff and nobody wants her and she has to prove herself over and over and over again, as most women do in the workplace. Um, and so I, I like it for that reason. I mean, sometimes I, I just feel stuck and wish I could 
<laughs> not do it and do something <laughs> different. Once you get on the series, you're kind of on a you're kind of on a treadmill. Sure. Um, I'm now really expected to produce a book a year. Wow. To infinity, That's, you know. Wow. Until something <laughs> something crashes. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like some pressure, but but I would imagine also less pressure because you have time or at least a, a series of books to continue to develop the character not everything has to happen from start to finish in in one book knowing that you have more coming did you run into situations either with bad x county or dead man dancing where you wanted to include something uh, about the characters but you thought maybe well maybe that can wait for the next book you, you put it aside yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, you're right that is an advantage of it is you don't you don't have to start over from scratch every time but the tricky thing about a series is you have to you have to keep in mind that somebody may start the series on book four mm -hmm. um, and, and so you know i've never i still haven't figured out how to handle that you know i really want people to start at the beginning because you learn why she's the way she is in in gut-wrenching detail um mm -hmm. And it's a different experience if you're starting at a different place in her story. So when you write uh, in a series, you always have to have this certain amount of overlap between, you know, what's already happening so that people that either read it and forgot or never read it to begin with can get the proper introduction to the, the setting, to the characters, to the protagonist and so forth. Uh, at the same sure. time, you can't get stuck in the mud and and bore your existing readers who have been with you the whole way so i find it's a pretty tricky line to walk one other writer i think does pretty well with that joseph haywood i've read a number of the woods cop mystery series because mm -hmm. they're set in the up and i've spent a right. lot of time in the up um but yeah i mean they're the kind of books where you don't have to read them but you all of them but you do get more out of it because there yeah. are references to characters previous actions and that sort of thing yeah, like yeah. i said it's it's really all one story mm -hmm. um, the, the character yeah. arc that i'm going through is gonna you know gonna gonna be arcing across however many books there are which could be four or eight or twelve or whatever so okay so you but don't at have the same a... time you have to make sure that that somebody can read it as a standalone novel and and get it yeah yeah um, one of the questions that we had come in, uh, there seems to be an increasing amount of pushback in popular culture these days about who is allowed to tell stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you encountered any resistance as a male author to writing a female protagonist? No, I haven't. And if I do, it'll bounce right off me. I'm sorry, but that's, <laughs> that's a writer's job is to be empathetic and inhabit, you know, the world around him and and i get the i get the general argument I, and and i get and agree with it you know in a way but um if you apply that standard you are wiping most literature off the face of the earth and so um sure. i i certainly i'm certainly sensitive to you know not appropriating other people's identities and stories for my own ends and not pretending that i know things that i don't um and if you read my series, you notice that I don't, for example, get terribly deep into Heidi's private business. I am not a woman. I'm not going there. But I do get into her parenting, which I can totally relate to. Um, she and I just have so much more in common than, uh, than we have out of common. Um, so, yeah, no, I haven't heard it. I mean, I, I, I'm sure people are out there ready to say it. Um, yeah. But well, I mean, the... does that mean I can't? I can't. I don't know. I mean, it, it, no, I don't. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, if you go by that logic, then it, you're eliminating half of your characters. Like you can only well, yeah. I mean, write I'm, about I'm not a farmer characters. either. Right. I'm not a farmer <laughs> either. I'm not, I'm not a lot of things. I'm not a criminal. Yeah. yeah. Much, not too much. Um, I haven't killed anybody. I, I you know, and so forth. Um, so I, yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I, I get the general argument and I understand it and, and respect it. And I think, um, you do have to be conscious, very conscious of that, um, and skillfully uh, tell the truth about a person without claiming to be that person and know everything about their their lives. Yeah. Well, and judging by the success of the books and the popular reviews it's received, it seems like 
a lot more people are glad you're writing about uh, a female protagonist in this way. And actually one of the other comments we had, my mom was the apple queen in Crawford County and my dad graduated from Viroco High School. We love your books and yeah. especially Heidi. So yeah. <laughs> That's there, there's a lot of queens out here. There's, yeah. there's many, many different kinds of queens. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Apple queen um, and, and snow queen and mm -hmm. pumpkin queen. and yeah. Dairy queen, yep, yep. Dairy queen. Well, we know you're familiar with the landscape around that area as it relates to your books, um, but did you do any research as far as, I mean, did you follow any sheriffs around or, or deputies around to try and get some inside knowledge of what it's like no. to be a sheriff? No, I fake it. I okay. just fake it. And, and one, uh, <laughs> one of my strategy, I have a, I have a deliberate strategy for that. Um, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to write and don't want to get engaged in uh, strict procedural um, crime writing. It's not my interest. It's not my strength. Um, I wouldn't turn down those opportunities uh, at all. I, I, well, let me back up. Yes, I have done that. I rode around uh, quite a bit at one point with a um, village police chief or a village police officer uh, around Madison and, you know, stayed up all night and saw, saw stuff and hung around with him. And so I have, I have done that. I haven't done that specifically with a sheriff's department. Um, but my strategy for that, because I don't want to get procedural, is I want to create stories that have so much momentum that immediately as soon as as soon as the first shoe drops there's no time for procedure um you know things are just blowing up right and left and you have to think fast and you know we're not going to get involved in uh complex police procedures and legal procedures and policies and so forth so i mean i'm just kind of i honestly just kind of don't want to go there uh, i want to be accurate i want to want to do dumb things so i you know i do enough research to to not uh stick my foot in it um, too badly, but mostly my strategy is to tell stories where that's not the point. Yeah. Sure. And one thing both that I noticed, I, I have not yet read Dead Man Dancing, but I did read about X County. Um, and one thing, just kind of looking around doing my own research about you, um, one of the things that, that does pop up is um, these two books, uh, or at least Bad Axe County, they're, they're not for kids. There's some rough stuff that happens in your books, which I think yeah. seems true to the work of any law enforcement officer. Sometimes yeah. you have to deal with violence and, and brutality and, and really bad stuff. And it seems like you don't shy away from that sort of thing in, in your yeah. what, what happened with, with Bad Axe County, which, uh, really involves sex trafficking is when when I got that advice from my agent to write the same book but a different story I started I went back and started doing more research ar around real rural crime to find out what you know rural law enforcement officers are dealing with and I came across an academic study that blew my mind and, and was perfect for Heidi Kick and it was this uh, these uh, researchers went around and asked law enforcement leaders across the Midwest in rural communities, police chiefs, sheriff's deputies, um, district attorneys, all this kind of stuff, uh, all men basically, or 90, 90 some percent men, uh, about sex trafficking in their jurisdictions. And they just said, what? Um, the researchers then went and asked a group of people who are primarily women, healthcare workers, rape crisis center workers, emergency room workers, uh, women's shelter workers, the same exact questions. And they said, it is an epidemic. Mm. Uh, and so that really got my attention. And it really told me that, okay, let's say with it, suddenly we have a woman in the sheriff's position. Uh, how does that start to look differently? What's things that are present in the community become visible and have to be confronted? Um, and in the process, you know, you talked about gruesome things happening. I, I had to do a lot of research into sex trafficking, which just it was horrifying. It's massive. It is beyond belief, really. Um, the scale of it and what actually goes on. Um, and, you know, it, it, I keep, uh, sometimes I have this feeling that I've written something that's exaggerated and it's over the top and no one's going to believe it. And then you know what happened the other day out here in Vernon County? Twice in the same day, somebody tried to abduct 
Amish kids off the side of the road. Oh my gosh. Probably for the purpose that we are discussing. Oh. And the Amish have now cleared the stores out, the Walmart and the local hardware store of Hornet spray. Because the kids are going to spray Hornet spray in your face if you pull your car over and try to pick them off, off the side of the road. Uh, this stuff happens. It's very real. It happens in rural communities. It happens all over the United States. And it's very different than I think we think it is. Um, partly because of digital technology, it's highly sophisticated. It's very mobile. Um, the trafficked individuals who are mostly, mostly women, but can be children and boys are moved to, to where the, where the demand is. Um, and I, talked to a um, the Madison city of Madison police detective who handles sex trafficking and he confirmed what my research said one is one thing that my research said that baffled me was uh, I came across this phrase Milwaukee is the Harvard of sex trafficking hmm. and so to unpack that is is quite a challenge it, it just means that that's that's where you learn how to do it properly uh, and he told me also confirming my research that uh, it's now mobile and digital, and the pimps are more brutal than ever because the women tech, uh, have the ability to to mar to market themselves online. So the things that the pimps have to do to keep their uh, property in line are more and more extreme. Uh, demand is as high as ever. The highest, uh, the biggest sex trafficking events of the year across the United States are any NASCAR event followed by the Super Bowl. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize that. Goodness yeah. gracious. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was stunning. And when I, when I started getting into it, I just didn't want to go there. And I, I was, I spent a couple, couple of months trying to, you know, write these scenes and chapters that were just so dark and so forth. But, uh, you know, the more I got into it, the more I said, you know, I'm not going to chicken out here. Um, yeah. It's important to tell this the way it really is. Uh, Can you see it through? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah it, got, it got dark right away and, and I just sure. decided to go with it. And it, okay. you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, perhaps something a, a little more uh, upbeat. Yeah, let's, let's change <laughs> um, the tone. <laughs> right, right. So um, your last series, it was a, a four book series about a nomad fly fisherman. Um, how do you approach a mystery with this series compared to that one in terms of um, either character development or situations, how situations, how the story is, is drawn out and, and tied together. In terms of just trying to tell a, a mystery, mm -hmm. um, is, is this series so far anyway, is it different than, than yep. your fly fishing different. series? It's very Not different for a number in terms of reasons. Of, you know, plot, but just how yeah, to tell a mystery. It's, yeah, it's different, and it's different for a, a, a variety of reasons. One reason it's different is it's really a different genre. Uh, the the fly fishing books are more in the cozy tradition, uh, and they're more in the amateur sleuth tradition. Um, okay. They're not real heavy and dark. Um, there is darkness and crime and so forth, but they're they're more funny than they are scary and. Um, the amateur, you know, the amateur sleuth is this is somebody who, you know, stumbles into a situation and because of a particular area of expertise, uh, ends up being the person that is critical to solving the murder. So that's, that's one big difference. It's really different genre. Uh, with the Heidi Kick books, I'm not really writing murder mysteries. I'm writing uh, some kind of hybrid between uh, suspense and mystery. Um, and Another big difference is that the fly fishing books are in first person. So there's a single first person point of view, which is a whole different kind of writing. Um, what I've done in the, in the Bad Axe series is I've, I've adopted a uh, multiple third person viewpoint approach. So in each one of my books, I have three uh, third person limited viewpoints. One of them is Heidi Kick and she's the central viewpoint, but and she, she will have, you know, 50 to 60% of the book. Uh, but the rest of it is two other characters that provide a different dimension 
and a different side of the experience. And so, in some ways, it's 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 you know it's it's that facilitates telling a very complex story um, because it shows so many different sides of the experience. And I have a little you know formula that I think about. I don't necessarily follow it all the time, but at one of you know one of my points of view is Heidi Kick, who's the person who's supposed to fix all this stuff that's gone wrong. Um, and another one of my points of view, I try to I try that to that person to be a local with some sort of you know inside knowledge who kind of knows mm -hmm. the situation. And with a third point of view, I try to have somebody who is innocent, relatively innocent, and who is a newcomer or an outsider um, who has to try to figure out how things work in the bad act. So having those three points of view uh, and having those two kind of characters work around Heidi Kick gives me ability to tell a very different kind of story than the, the first person. Um, yeah. and that's one of the story. things that I enjoyed about Bad Axe County, you, which you did a, sort of a similar sort of thing. I believe it's Heidi's brother, the baseball player. So you have, um, is it her brother? No, it's, it's the, and or, I guess, no, no, he's just a kid from the, yeah, he's it's just same, a, same town. Yep. Yeah, or yeah. same area. Right. Yeah, so you have his storyline that that kind of runs along in parallel to Heidi's. Yeah, it's so it's not just about one person's, you know, one person within this story. You're able to, yeah, mix a few different things in there. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a little tricky because you you know, you don't you don't want the reader to get too far ahead of the of Heidi. So Mm -hmm. There's always a balance between uh, what you're revealing. Um, you don't want the reader to, to some extent, it's productive to have the reader think, come on, Heidi, come on, Heidi, I know what you need to do. You got to get there and watch her get there, but you don't want to do too much of that. So you always have to balance the flow of information when you have the viewpoint. I find that fascinating with, with fiction writers, um, how your characters really do take on a life of their own, and you're just sort of you're kind of following along with them. <laughs> and it, it seems like maybe your, your brain is, you have to kind of keep up with your brain and, and the character because they, they do, um, yeah, they, they take on life of their own and you have to just kind of, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> it seems like, yeah, sometimes maybe the, the story kind of, gets ahead of you a little bit maybe and you have to kind of back writing up. is a very complex process writing sure. a novel is a is a weird and and in some way completely inexplicable interchange between left brain and right brain and memory and imagination and stubbornness and uh creativity and um how it all ha gets done i'm not, really not even sure but you're right there's a lot to keep track of and and ideally your characters do take off on their own ideally they just start doing what they should do and you just it's your you know it's your job just to sort of pay attention and um you know uh not use too many words yeah i have the same fascination with songwriters i don't know how people write songs like i can tell when i hear a good song but how does somebody create a song or a novel just out of thin air it continues to fascinate me <laughs> but um yeah so um we've got a little bit of time left uh one of our other questions um since we're all isolated maybe not quite quarantined but um what are you reading during these pandemic times you and i were talking before the event started and I saw you've been doing some camping and fishing but what are you reading these days i am doing a lot of research for my fourth book um so you were talking about the second book, but I'm deep into the fourth book. So I'm reading a lot about cults and conspiracies and that kind of thing. I just finished a fantastic book. You guys all probably know John Krakauer. Um, I read his book, Un Under the Banner of Heaven, okay. about Mormon fundamentalism. Wow. Uh, I'm reading uh, an excellent book about Waco and the tragedy that happened there. And, and there's so much I didn't know about that. What a circus. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing that kind of thing. Um, what am I reading for fiction? Oh, yeah. I'm reading um, a guy named David Rhodes, who is a Midwest guy. Um, he, he grew up in Iowa. Uh, he went to the Iowa Writers Workshop and he wrote uh, three terrific novels about this area. 
Um, the last fair deal going down, Easter House and Rock Island Line. And so I'm reading my way through David Rhodes. He had a motorcycle accident and disappeared from the scene for a long time, like 30 years, and then came back with a book called Driftless. Uh, and all this is um, very highly regarded literature, um, absolutely unique. So I'm reading that. Um, I'm reading uh, my way through Steinbeck, reading and or rereading my way through Steinbeck. Um, and I don't know, I could go on. Yeah. I'm, you know, I read, I read, I get the local newspaper here and I read that from cover to cover, including the, the classifieds. And, and I can tell you what's for lunch at the senior center on a, any given day. <laughs> Well, we were also talking before you used to work at a newspaper, so uh, yeah, yep. that's right. Good, support your local yeah, newspaper. Chad and I worked for the same employer, not the same newspaper, but the same yep. employer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're doing research for the fourth book. So the third book in in the Kick series the is is in the. Is... Aha! Mad Moon Rising. Okay. Wow. That's a that's a you know uncorrected galley. So it's you know. Sure. It's, but yeah, the third book is in the is in the hopper. I'm working on the copy editing right now. Okay. It'll Do you be have uh, next summer? Next summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So, is that how is that pretty common? Like in this case, the second one comes out and the third one is pretty much already lined up. Well, you mentioned they're they're expecting you to do one a year. That's <laughs> right. that's a little pressure, probably. Well, uh, it was a tremendous amount of pressure the first the first time through because I didn't know if I could do it. Yeah, uh, I'm a slow writer. Um, I've got a full time job, as you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I was terribly worried that I would screw it up, and mm -hmm. I could, and that I couldn't do it, or that I could do it, but it would take so much out of me that you know it'd be the end of me. Um, <clears throat> and and it's yeah. still a, a hard to do, but I've done it. I'm now on my fourth, you know, the third time that I've written a book in a year. And it's easier than the first time that I had to write a book in a year. I feel more, obviously, more confident about it and a little less freaked out. And, but, you know, yeah, there's pressure because I'm the kind of person that can write, you know, 300 pages and then throw it all away because I don't, I'm not happy with it. And, you know, that, hmm. that could happen at any time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Well, we're glad you uh, haven't thrown these away. Um, they're they're great you. stories and we really enjoy your writing. And uh, we're really, really happy that you could join us today, John. Really appreciate Thank you, Jack. it. Thank Jack, for having me. I wish you the best of luck with the festival. It's a, it's a tough time to time run a, run a book festival. So you're doing a great job. <laughs> we're Thank glad you. we're able to still pull it off virtually. Everything's going okay so far. So, um, yeah. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. Uh, again, yeah. Dead Man Dancing is out. Um, you can find it at either your local library or better yet, wherever books are sold. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you very much. We'll see you Thanks soon. Everybody. Thanks again, John. Take care. Going fishing. Bye. All right. Good for you. Thanks. <laughs>